Good morning, Life Spring. Pastor Tony here. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship services for April 5th. Gather your family around you, get your cup of coffee and your cookies, because we're going to get started. As you can look around and see, I'm here in my backyard, surrounded by my palm trees, because today we celebrate Palm Sunday, an event that took place almost 2,000 years ago as the long-awaited King of the Jews, the Messiah, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the acclaim of the crowds. This was the fulfillment of prophecies stretching back 1,500 years. It should have been a day of celebration for all the Jews. It was for some. They cut palm branches and waved them before the Messiah as he rode into Jerusalem. They threw them down on the ground in their, their cloaks and their tunics as well and, and, and shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. For others, the celebration on the road into Jerusalem was just a distraction in their already busy schedules. Others still just ignored him. And others told the crowds to be quiet. I want to explore today the attitude of the heart that led to those different responses to Jesus on Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of Passion Week, which begins on Palm Sunday and ends on Easter Sunday. In the middle of the week, there's Maundy Thursday, which is the day the church has traditionally celebrated the Last Supper. And there's Good Friday, the day the church has traditionally celebrated the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We've got a couple of announcements I want to go over. I want to invite you to celebrate a combined Maundy Thursday and Good Friday service by tuning in to a video we took of a service back in 2013. I'll be posting that video in the next couple of days, and you can look at it at your leisure this week. We're doing our growth groups via Zoom, and the Zoom invitation and the class notes will be posted on the website at the beginning of the week. You're always welcome to join a group, even if it's been going on for some time. Just pull up the Zoom invitation and click on it about ten, five to ten minutes before the class is supposed to begin. On Sunday morning, our Sunday morning services are going to be posted on our church website at lscc.us. That's where the Zoom invitations and the class notes will be for the growth groups as well. We're also posting our Sunday morning services on our faith Facebook page, which is you can find it by looking up Life Spring Moore Park on Facebook. Also on our YouTube channel, we'll be posting it as well for those that want to be able to stream it to their television sets. Find some creative ways to connect with one another this week. Uh, look for God to speak to you about some specific people that you're to call or email or text or Facebook during the week. And I want to thank you to everyone who is continuing to give electronically through our various online means. Uh, last week, we had a pretty good offering, and I just really appreciate you guys stepping up during this time of crisis. It's an act of faith on your part, and, and it's an act of love towards me and towards LifeSpring in general. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let's pray. And, and in a moment, we're going to spend some time in worship with MJ and Edna. Uh, before we do that, let's just go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to celebrate this great day. And we just ask for your spirit to bind us together, even though we're in living rooms and family rooms all around this county. Bind us together as your church this morning as we worship you and shout Hosanna. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship for a few minutes, and then I'll be back to talk to you from God's Word. Your 
College student Brady Sluter from Ohio gained notoriety last month for indulging in spring break partying during a pandemic. He said at the time, if I get corona, I get corona. At the end of the day, I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. We're just out here having a good time. Whatever happens, happens. Well, I'm betting his mom had a good talk with him because he has since apologized, saying our generation may feel invincible like I did when I made my comments, but we have a responsibility to our communities. I don't want to endanger the elderly or other at-risk people in my life. Well, I say, well done, Brady. We have this global enemy that wants to take us all down, and some are taking it seriously, while others think it's a hoax, and they're continuing with life as usual. Yet the warnings and the proof are there. And if that wasn't enough, the death toll is updated for us every hour or so on the news. Life cannot continue in peace without getting rid of this enemy first. We can't party. We can't go to church. We can't even talk to our neighbors like we used to. Even as Sylvia and I have gone out for our daily walks, people either cross the road or walk out into the street to avoid us. Now, People have always treated me like that, but it's been a new experience for Sylvia. Our best human efforts seem inadequate to overcome this. We're told the only thing we can do is bend the curve. So what hope do we really have? Our hope is where it's always been. It's grounded in God and in particular the events of Jesus' life that began on Palm Sunday and culminated on Easter. If you want to follow along with me, open your Bibles or or your Bible apps to Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 7. On our website at lscc.us, the growth group or the growth resources tab, you will find a note-taking outline to help you follow along and an action plan to help you apply this lesson throughout the week. So let's go ahead and read God's word together. Matthew 21 verse 7 says this, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray and see what God wants to teach us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would take your word and apply it to our understanding in our minds and apply it to our hearts to bring conviction. Help us to know you better and understand this story of Palm Sunday and how it relates to our lives today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we read this passage, there's clearly no social distancing taking place. And though we don't see it so clearly here in Matthew's account, there was a great deal of spiritual distancing that was happening. Luke tells us in his gospel, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. In the first century, they didn't have Corona, but they did have Rome-ona. Just like people today dealing with the virus, some people tried to coexist with Rome. Others tried to ignore it. Still others tried to fight it. And some even tried to join it. The same thing is true about Jesus. Some people hear the Palm Sunday and Easter stories and and they try to force their normal lives to coexist with it. Others realize that's not really possible and so they just just ignore Jesus. Others, Others try to fight him. But there are always those who look at the evidence, who listen to the proofs, who hear the warnings and decide to accept him. But when we talk about accepting Jesus, what is it that we have to accept about him? Well, there's three things. 
we first have to accept that Jesus is a historical fact. See, the Jews had a tradition that went back more than 2,000 years that some child would be born that would live and die to save the world. The first question we have to answer is whether Jesus is the child the historical narrative had promised. A a Barna poll from 2015 said that 92% of American adults accept that Jesus was a real person. If you're part of the millennial generation, that number drops to about 87%, still pretty high. But if you were me when I was in college, that number drops to zero. As you may know, I was a big old skeptic. I had rejected everything about God and the Christmas and Easter stories. I had placed Luke's stories in with Frosty and Charlie Brown and the Easter Bunny. Cute, fun, made up, and therefore irrelevant in terms of real life. But there was something nagging at me the whole time. This story, it sounded different. Yeah, Frosty came to life with a magic hat owned by a magician, and we know his name, Professor Hinkle. But we don't know the name of the teacher or the school or the city where these these events took place. And so there's no way for us to confirm or deny the story. And our logic tells us, probably not. The Luke story is different. It starts with a reference to Caesar Augustus, whom we can look up in Encyclopedia Britannica, and gives us a fairly good time reference for when these events took place. In fact, the story is filled with names of people and places and events that, if they're real, can be tracked down with a a high degree of, of certainty. In fact, it's been the very specifics of names and dates and people and places that has offered skeptics like the man I used to be throughout the ages such an opportunity to reject the story of Jesus. And that's, that's what sounded different to me about Luke's story. See, I expect a fictional story about Christmas like the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, to be written in 1843. Fictional stories were being written in the 1800s, and Christmas was a tradition already firmly entrenched in English society. I expect a fictional story to be written in the 1700s or to be talked about and told to children in the 1700s about a magical rabbit who laid colored eggs in special nests made by children who believed. A lot of fictional children's stories were being told to kids at the time. What I don't expect is a fictional story to be written independently by four different people in the first century AD. First of all, there were were no fictional stories being written in narrative form at the time, nor would there be for another 1,800 years. And there were no Christmas or Easter stories traditions to hang these fictional stories on. That's what was nagging me. If the story of Jesus were fictional, it should have been written in the 1800s. No, no, this story had to be the genesis of all of those other stories. This story presented the historical narrative that formed the tradition that all of our other stories are are hung upon. This story had to have substance. We must first accept that Jesus is an actual historical person. But more than that, we have to go beyond that and accept Jesus as our Savior. In in Matthew 21, verse 9, it says, Oops. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the phrase the crowd was shouting. And the phrase, the son of David, was a messianic title that was given to Jesus or given to the Messiah in the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. He said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. See, the crowds were shouting, Blessed is the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. That word Hosanna, it means save us now. They called him the son of David, meaning that they recognized that he was the savior that they were looking for. The people were actually quoting a messianic psalm, a psalm written a thousand years before the time of Christ, Psalm 118. And among other things, it says this, out of my distress, I called on the Lord and the Lord answered me and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us. Hosanna. We pray, Lord. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, Psalm 118 is a psalm of hope for those living in the valley of the shadow of death, no matter where they are and what generation they're living in. For the writer of this psalm, it was the king who was trying to kill him. For the Jews of the first century, it was Rome trying to kill them. For us, maybe it's a virus or a financial crisis, or maybe it's something else that only you know about that's trying to kill you. But this... This is a universal psalm of deliverance from what enemy you're facing. And Jesus, Jesus is the object of the psalm and he is the universal savior. Now sometimes, sometimes the oppressors that are attacking us are vanquished. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes the diseases are healed and sometimes they're not. Sometimes all you can do is socially distance yourself, but all the time, all the time, Jesus is our Savior. The Apostle Paul writes this this and says, says, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For the sin, for sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives it its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you accept Jesus as your Savior, I can promise you, he will save you. Perhaps from the enemies you face in this world, maybe not. But he will save you from your ultimate enemy, which is death. Nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, including the things that we're living through right now. He doesn't promise that we won't die. He promises that death won't separate us from God. Even if you survive this virus, you will die at some point. The death rate for this virus is like, I don't know, 2%. But the death rate for humanity is 100%. That's when we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Will you accept him as your Savior today? There's one final stage in this progression of acceptance. After accepting the reality of Jesus and accepting him as our Savior, you still need to accept Jesus as your King. They said in in, in Matthew 21, 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. See, the prophet Zechariah wrote about this event 520 years before it happened. He said, rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. And he is riding on a donkey. He's riding on a donkey's colt. Now, what do we mean by accepting him as our king? The people of Christ's day were willing to accept him as an earthly king. That is, they were willing to accept what his authority and power on their behalf 
might mean against their enemies. The spiritual rule and reign of Christ over their own lives was the furthest thing from their minds. They wanted earthly and material benefits. And, you know, we can be like that too. We want his kingly power when we're in need and we pray and either for physical or material needs and, and we want his kingly power to, to meet our needs. But sometimes we don't want anything to do with his kingly authority over our conduct, over our behaviors. When we think about God having spiritual authority over our lives, we think about all the things we can't do. But that's not how God thinks about it nor is it how we ought to think about it. All those things we think we want to do but can't do if we accept Jesus as our king are things that the devil wants us to be involved in. And Jesus calls him a thief. And he says this in John 10.10. He says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. This abundant life, this satisfying life that Jesus wants to offer us, it includes peace and purpose, destiny, a genuine purpose for living, the joy of facing any adversity without fear, and the ability to endure hardship with confident assurance. To give us all that, Jesus entered Jerusalem as her king on Palm Sunday. Picture it. The Son of God riding on a donkey's colt. Behold, your king comes. Not to enjoy the earthly benefits afforded an earthly king, but to take responsibility for his people, for their sins, for those who accept him. And then, Four short days later, this same Jesus, for whom the crowd shouted, Hosanna, heard the crowds shout, crucify him, crucify him. And then he went to the cross on Good Friday and died to pay the penalty for the sins of everyone who's willing to accept him, to accept his reality to accept him as Savior, and to accept him as King. Will you accept him today? Jesus died to pay the penalty for all those actions and thoughts that separate you from a holy God. Can you acknowledge your need today? Can you acknowledge your sin, that you have done things wrong? And can you accept the grace of your Savior, can you accept the authority of your king? Because if you can, if you can, eternity is yours. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Come and take your place as the king of my life, tell me what's right and what's wrong and make me the kind of person you created me to be, the kind of person that I, in my best moments, want to be. For I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving you my heart and all that is within, I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new.
singing you this song I'm waiting at the cross And all the world holds dear I count it all as loss The sake of knowing you The glory of your name To know the lasting joy Amen. Palm Sunday was the beginning of a special week on the Jewish calendar. It's called Passover week. And Passover was the day the Jews celebrated freedom. It commemorated a great miracle. The Jews had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years, and the Pharaoh would not let them go free. So God sent an angel of death to kill the firstborn in every home in Egypt. He warned everyone. He said, if you will sacrifice a lamb and put its blood on the doorframe of your home, I will accept the death of the lamb for the death of the firstborn in your home. And the angel of death will pass over your home. Hence the term Passover. That lamb was to be taken into the home four days before Passover. It was to live with the family, eat at the table, sleep with the kids. It also did other things. It chewed on the furniture, peed on the rugs, and pooped all over the place. So four days later, there were two kinds of people in that home. There were people who absolutely loved the lamb. And there were people who could not wait until Passover and the lamb would be gone. Palm Sunday that year, 2,000 years ago, was the day the lamb was to be brought into the house. Jesus was fulfilling that symbolic role when he arrived in Jerusalem. Over the next four days, the city divided itself into two separate camps. Those who absolutely loved Jesus and those who couldn't wait for him to go away. The world is still divided into those two same two camps. The question for us this morning is, which camp are you in? If you would like to talk to someone about your relationship with God, text the word Jesus to 805-285-2636. That's 805-285-2636. And someone will get back to you. We're going to celebrate communion next Sunday on Easter. Sylvia, my wife, has purchased these little self-contained uh, communion uh, kits for all of the adults in our congregation. We'll be distributing them to everyone in our congregation who attends at least a couple times a month. Sylvia's packing them up and wearing gloves and a face mask and using liberal amounts of antiviral disinfectant so you can be sure that they're safe. But if you want, you can, of course, 
get your own crackers and grape juice if you would prefer to do that. If you think you may not be included on our list for some reason, please contact the church office today at office at lscc.us. Also, if you live in a gated community, please email the church office at, L, at office at lscc.us your gate code today so that we can drop these off to you. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next Sunday. God bless.